Okay, good afternoon. Today we will uh, continue our overview of sensor devices for robot manipulators. And I would say in this case, more in general for robots, including mobile robots, because many of these exteroceptive sensors are mainly used for mobile robotics. So we have already introduced this uh, distinction between proprioceptive and exteroceptive sensing. So we will go through uh, this class of sensors, starting with those that require some contact between the robots and objects or the environment. So we'll start looking at four sensors. Uh, and in particular, we will first see the fundamental elementary component, which enables to measure some force, some stress along some direction. These are strain gauges. And you can use strain gauges also in a proprioceptive way, so to understand what are the internal forces in the structure. And one combination of this gives rise to the so-called joint torque sensor. So a sensor which is able to capture the fact that the motor is providing torque to the link through a transmission, but the transmission is not infinitely stiff, so it will go undergo some deformation, and if you put some strain gauges there, or some more complex joint torque sensor, you're able to measure the transmitted torque to the link, okay? Then uh, strain gauges are the basic component for the so-called force torque sensor. This is uh, typically comes with a 6D in front because this means that this is a sensor which is capable of measuring six independent quantities, namely three linear forces and three torques around uh, the axis of a reference frame which is attached to the sensor itself, and this four-store sensor is usually mounted at the wrist of the robot. Or, if you wish, at the real end of the kinematic chain, when we have the final flange, we can mount with bolts uh, such sensor, and then beyond this sensor we can mount also the tool or whatever other end effector. As a special or simpler device which is, looks like a 6D force torque sensor, but it's not really a sensor, although it behaves in a similar way. We will mention also the RCC, which stands for Remote Center of Compliance, which is a passive device uh, that accommodates forces by introducing some displacement at the level of the end effector which is mostly used for uh, assembly operation, where we have to insert some object in another object. This operation is typically called peg-in-hole uh, assembly. In that case, RCC are very useful. And we will see some videos of how uh, an RCC works and how four-store sensors can be used for handling some uncertainty in the contact with the environment. Because if there were no uncertainty in the contact, we would not even need uh, a force torque sensor, okay, or a force sensor. Because we could predict exactly what happens. But since we don't know the characteristic of the environment, how stiff it is, we don't know exactly where it's located with respect to the end effector of the robot, there are a lot of tasks which involve contact that needs forces to be measured in order to understand if the robot is progressing in the right way or is going in the wrong direction or is hitting too much hard uh, the environment. Okay. Then we will move to non-contact sensors or proximity sensor and there are a lot of sensing devices uh, working with different physical principles. We will start from the simplest one, or the cheapest sensor, I would say, infrared sensor. Uh, then we will talk a bit about ultrasound sensor, laser, and so
so-called structured light sensor, which are a combination of laser or uh, light passing through grids. So structuring the image that a camera can collect in order to understand, for instance, the depth of things or the relative position of things. And then we will move to vision, vision system. We'll briefly discuss uh, the principle of vision, also some mathematics related to the transformation of points that live in the 3D space into pixel in the image plane, how these uh, are related, okay? And finally, we will see some uh, example of uh, complete sensor suits on different robot manipulators and uh, mobile robots, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, even in this case, my presentation will be intertwined by videos. I don't think that we are going through all this material today, so we will stop at some points, certainly before vision, maybe around la laser or something like this, and then we will resume on Friday. And on Friday, oh, okay, I cancel this. On Friday, we will also start talking about inverse kinematics, and the next week will be devoted to that subject so that you are, in a sense, prepared for the class self-test, which comes in two weeks. Okay, so let's start with how do we measure force or torque. Actually, this measure is a, an indirect measure. So we are not really having a, a dynamometer. We can use, I don't know if you've ever seen them, or like a, a wage uh, in the marketplace. Uh, this measures directly force, actually measure the effect of gravity on masses, okay? So we don't use this, usually you don't use this in, ro in robots, but you measure force by having some variation of an electrical quantities which is related with the deformation that force induces on materials. Okay, so this is the basic concept. So we need to have some material which undergoes deformation, otherwise we don't measure anything. If we have an infinitely stiff object, if we apply force, nothing happens. This is why it's infinitely stiff, so we cannot see deformation, okay? And as a matter of fact, uh, you have to choose the correct material which sustain uh, the rest of the structure, so it's, it's not too thin, but where deformations are sensible with respect to applied force. On this piece of metal, you can put this elementary uh, object, which is a strain gauge. You can write gauge with a new or without you. You can find both uh, terminology in English. And uh, this is a circuit which has some resistance. And uh, it's a metal conductor. So the strain gauge uses this principle. When we uh, change or stress this object where this circuit is uh, linked to, then resistance will change as a result of the geometric change of the circuit. You will typically see a circuit which is very compact with a lot of length just to give more sensitivity local to the point where you're measuring uh, stress, okay? So uh, actually you have a, for these devices you have a section and a length and of course the longer is the device the more the resistance. So this partial derivative on the left of the slide says exactly this one. So if you have uh, compression or tension on these uh, strain gauges, the fact that you have a, a, a total length which increases means that its resistance to currents that you let circulate by applying voltage uh, will increase, okay? 
Of course, there's also a, a complementary effect, namely that the section will become thinner, smaller, and so the resistance will have a change. So the smaller this, the larger the resistance. Okay? So this effect, uh, essentially, you have to measure force through measuring a deformation. Actually, you're measuring the deformation looking at the variation of resistance of a small circuit. Okay, this is the chain, the measurement chain. And of course, like in any measurement chain, you may have a problem of stability. So for instance, you would like that the variation of resistance independent of the application of forces, for instance, due to temperature, to ambient temperature, or to the fact that this object is an electronic object with energy going in, so heating up, and you won't, don't want to see a variation of resistance because of a change of temperature. Okay, or at, you would like to minimize this effect, so you, you would like to have what we have mentioned, what we have called a stable measurement device. In this case, this is the meaning. So, this is a typical strain gauge. You can see the uh, size. This is about 10 millimeter. And this uh, strain gauge is mounted on a specific, on a particular circuit, which is called Whetstone Bridge. Did you ever encounter this in your electrotechnic or circuit studies? One, only one, two, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, the idea for those who doesn't know this type of structure, suppose that you remove this branch. So you apply an input tension, which is constant, VI, and then you have a, a partition hmm, of resistance. So you, to understand how this works, you can start with this simple so I will put RS here and then R3 here and then going back and then I will take some uh, tension here. So this is a partitioner uh, with two resistance. So V output will be RS over Rs plus R3 of V input. Okay? Now, if you put in the yellow box the strain gauge, and if you have a variation of this, uh, you can say that there has been some force applied to. So, first of all, you have to solve for Rs here. So, in order to solve for Rs, you have Rs, uh, sorry, this is R3. Nobody noticed that. Hmm? So this is Rs plus R3 times V0 equal R3, V output, sorry, V input. And then Rs is R3 Vi minus V0 divided by V0. Or you can write it as R3 and then VI minus V0 minus 1. Okay, so you uh, look at some tension in output and you have this information. You, you know the input, you know the resistance of this part and so you can compute the resistance of the sensor. And you know that this resistance is changing and you notice it by looking at the output tension because of the application of some force. Of course you need to calibrate this device hmm? because you have to relate known forces to known variation of output sensing, so known variation of resistance. Okay. Uh, however, in, in this case, this is a uh, a situation, I mean, this is not the Whetstone Bridge. The Whetstone Bridge does the same, but using a double partitioner, 
Because then you take the differences of two partitions, so you will eliminate some common mode. So you have a differential sensing which eliminates some bias to the structure. So this is more accurate, eh? for more accurate measuring resistance. But only one partitioner could work. Now you mount two, and in general you have this type of expression, eh? which is a variant of this. You know, you take the difference between one path, so you have this resistance, this voltage here is R2 over R1 plus R2. Uh, current will be partitioned according to the resistance of the two branches, minus the same that we had before. Okay, and then from there you can solve for RS. Now, uh, typically, the, this is a general Whetstone bridge. What you do is you choose three resistance, R1, R2, R3, which are possibly equal, so very well matched, and the resistance of the sensor of the strain gauge without stress, so at rest, should be matched to those, so that you have a zero output, huh? in a sense, because you have the difference of two similar things. No? If you put all R here, you have one half minus one half, and this will give zero output. And then as soon as something changes, and the only thing that could change is RS, you will see a variation. And this is the most sensitive uh, structure. Actually, now you can look back to the fundamental element, so independent of the fact how you mount this into an electrical circuit, and the fundamental element, this train gauge, typically has the so-called gauge factor, uh, which is the uh, percentage variation of resistance over the percentage variation of uh, length, so of strain, because this is subject to some force in the main direction. Okay? Of course, you can mount this train gauge so that to cover different direction, orthogonal direction, and also you can use uh, two-point bridges, uh, which are connected uh, one opposite to the other, so that one bridge is sensitive to tension and one to compression on the other side, so you double the sensitivity. Okay? So this is the, there are a lot of techn technological uh, aspects in, in mounting these uh, strain gauges, so I won't... So, but pay attention that this gauge factor is not so, such a large number. This is why you need uh, whetstone bridges, you need electronic which amplify the signal in a very noise-free way, and so on, because you're really measuring uh, small, very small variations. Okay, so here uh, there's a picture, uh, and as I mentioned, this is a use of strain gauges mainly for proprioceptive information, because this is a one link arm moving in the horizontal plane, really not something very interesting, except for the fact that this is a flexible arm. So it's a flexible arm when it moves under the motion of a robot mounted at the base. Here you see there's a big motors directly coupled to the base, so there's no reduction, no friction, uh, and needs to do slew maneuver of this beam, which is about 700 grams, so less than one kilo, and it's about 70 centimeter long, and if you just apply torque in one direction, maximum torque, this will move and will deform at the tip by 10, 15 centimeter. So it's quite flexible and quite lightweight. Why did we do, we, did we design these devices together with the mechanical department of the other school of engineering? because we wanted to study how to control vibration. Uh, take into account the space shuttle manipulator arm, very long, very flexible. So if on such simple device you are understand what to do in order to keep the formation limited or to remove oscillation as fast as possible, then the same concept can be applied to a real problem like the one of the space shuttle arm, okay? So here, 
there are seven uh, pairs, actually, double bridges mounted on one side of the link and on the other side of the link, and measuring deformation in seven positions. Not really uniformly distributed. There's also an issue of, this is a mechanical issue, when you bend an object, there will be, and depending on where you uh, keep the object with your hands, so at the, at the boundaries here or at some point intermediate, the way in which it bends is different. And there are points where the curvature of the deformation is larger, and those are the points where you put your strain gauges. So depending on the structure, there is an optimal placement of this in order to measure at best deformation, which is distributed in nature. You may need, in principle, an infinite number of strain gauges to know the deformation in all points, but it's enough to have it in a selected number of places. Here in seven places was found more than enough. Another aspect is that these strain gauges, and this is always the case, are glued to the beam, okay? And this gluing, so they are attached. And if you think about it, when you glue something and you typically induce some stress if you're not able to remove the formation due to the fact that the glue is uh, compacting itself. So if you glue something which is sensitive to deformation, and this is per se already deformed by the gluing process, you will see a variation of resistance where there is no variation at all. So you have to be very carefully to remove this. And one reason for having differential uh, evaluation of tension with the Weston bridge is exactly for removing this type of effect. Anyway, uh, what do you do with this? You measure the formation and eventually you uh, use this for commanding better the arm. Here I have a video which uh, actually uses a model that we have identified based on these strain gauges in order to command this flexible beam to execute a <coughs> rest to rest maneuver, so from rest to rest, 90 degrees in two seconds. So after two seconds, everything should be at rest again, so without residual oscillation. And this is what happens, just to have a, a feeling of what. Okay, so it's, it, it moves as if it was a rigid arm. In fact, it is not. In fact, it's, I'm sorry, I should see, I should show you also the effect of a PD controller, which just bring this to the desired position. It will stay there forever, oscillating. This just starts and stops in two seconds exactly at the destination without residual oscillation. Okay, so that's, that's about it for strain gauges. Now, how do you use these strain gauges inside a robot? Well, this is one possibility, and in fact, I'm referring to a very old project. You may recognize this drawing. This is a Unimation Puma arm. So we are talking about uh, 1974, 1975. Uh, here you have, you see also the location of some of the motor inside the arm, there is a motor here at the base, and this is used for changing the first angle, huh? so the first axis. Uh, there is another motor mounted on link two, which moves join two. It's like uh, a jockey huh? on the horse and changing the position of the horse uh, while mounting on it. This is motor two. And then there's a motor three, which is not placed at the elbow, but it's placed close to the base of link two, actually a bit beyond, so that it counterbalanced link two because of its mass. Uh, the motors are the heaviest part most of the time in a robot structure. So the motor is here and it needs to transfer motion at the end of the link where is join three. And this transfer is made by uh, a long shaft. And since you have a long shaft and 
it's really difficult to align things properly, at the start and at the end, you use these which are called flexible couplings or uh, bellow couplings, which are flexible objects which realign things or adjust themselves passively so that you have two axes, even if you have a slight mis misplacement in the position, so they are not perfectly aligned, you recover this without destroying the shaft itself uh, after few rotation. Okay? So this is here, so you're coming, this is link three, so you're moving link three with joint three, so this is link two, and when you reach to this point through the transmission, you see here it's a long shaft, another flex, flexible coupling like this one, there's one close to the motor and one close to the joint. You have here a gear which changed the rotation of this axis into another direction with some reduction, and then in this part, you have a flexor which is sensitive to deformation. So you put a strain gauge right close to the driven link eh, after the long transfer of the uh, motor shaft. And so you can feel the fact that you're transmitting torque and that you have some deformation in this structure and this is sensed by the strain gauge. So you have a joint torque sensor, even if it's not placed exactly at the joint, but the, uh, you can extract a single scalar value, a torque, which is exactly proportional to the torque produced by the motor and going through the transmission. Okay? And this is useful. Uh, now, why should I measure this? But for instance, you can use this measure in order to remove friction from your device. Uh, you do a feedback from this in joint torque sensor and you can pretty much reduce the mechanical friction in the system. So the mechanical friction is there, is still there, but you compensate automatically with a feedback loop for that effect. Okay, so that's it for the use of proprioceptive. Even this application was proprioceptive because there is no contact with the environment. Now, these uh, strain gauges are in fact the basis for the force torque sensor typically mounted at the robot wrist. So what is this force torque sensor? It's a device, 99% of the time looks like a cylinder. I've shown you already some picture of that and we will see more, which is typically located at the end of the kinematic chains. And these are two plates. Let's do a, a drawing. So suppose that the robot is here, starts somewhere and ends here, and then we have a first plate and then a second plate, and internally this plate are connected by thin mechanical devices. Okay, so this is the top plate and this is the bottom plate. And on these thin legs, you have several strain gauges. This, there are different, different topology of uh, construction, but this is one classical. There's another one which we'll see later on, which is called Maltese cross. Because inside, the two plates are connected by a Maltese cross. So you don't see this because Everything is inside a cylinder, but in fact, if you keep the robot fixed in this position and you apply forces here, these thin parts will deform. You will measure this deformation through strain gauges, so you have changes of some electrical signal that you can process and reconstruct the actual measurement, because this plate, the top plate is kept fixed by the robot, while this is changing slightly position in response to the applied force and torques. Okay, so this is the basic concept. So you have a, 
Uh, these two plates, top and bottom, connected by a number of deformable elements on which you measure strain by strain gauges. Of course, if you want to measure a force in this direction, a force in this direction, a force in this direction, and these are three independent quantities, and then a moment so associated to this, you can imagine that you have some uh, Z sensor, X sensor, Y sensor. I hope this is a right-handed frame. <laughs> uh, so you can measure force along this and this and this direction and also torques around these three axes. These are the six quantities that you're interested in. Of course, it, sometimes you have an excitation that is not just one single component. Uh, if I'm pushing in this direction, I will see forces in different com on different axes and also some moments probably. So you need to have one sensing element for at least one sensing element for any of these elementary forces or torques. So a strain gauge which is sensible to f of z, one of to f of x, one to f of y, and then somehow other strain gauges which are sensible to the moments or torques, M, mx, my, and mz, okay? Now, uh, mechanically, however, it's very difficult to decouple this measurement. So if I'm applying a force only in the direction z, typically I will sense some deformation also in other direction, just because of the coupling of the mechanical element and of the deformation. So it's not so clean. This is why one uses more than six of such deformable element and then try to smooth out this phenomena. And then again, on each deformable element, one mounts uh, two pairs of strain gauges, so in opposition, so that you double the sensitivity. So this is one possible situation. I hope you, uh, well, you don't see much, but we will come back on this. So this is uh, just a, a scheme. You see this Maltese cross. So this is just having this cylinder open up. In fact, you never seen this internal structure. This is just a drawing. Huh, for It's not this type of connection, it's a different connection. You have uh, a thin, thin parts uh, with a solid body uh, for anchoring things. And on these thin parts where these arrows are placed, you mount strain gauges. And as a matter of fact, this device has eight strain gauges, mm? two for each arm of this uh, Maltese cross. Okay. So these are typical size of a four-store sensor. The diameter is about 10 centimeter. Uh, five centimeter of height. Depending on the size and on how are the material used inside, you may have ranges of measurement which goes from, uh, uh, well, in this case, 50 Newton, but actually you can have one order or two order of magnitude less. So let's say one model can, can go between 50 and 500 Newton of linear force measurement with this type of resolution. So 1% would be uh, 5 Newton, so 0.1% would mean 0.5 Newton as resolution. You remember what resolution means. And then uh, a different sensitivity for the angular quantity. Here we are measuring torques in Newton meters. These are forces. And you can see that there's a different range in general. Another very important thing is how fast this sensor provides a reliable output for your controller. Because if you need 10 seconds for measuring force, this may be perfectly right for an application where you do things statically. You bring a huge machine in contact with an object, you stay there, you measure for 10 seconds, and then you have the force. But this is not the case of robotic applications, so you need to have very fast measurement. 
And this one kilohertz, so one set of data, six dimensional data every millisecond, uh, used to be a dream 20 years ago, now it's the standard, okay? Uh, so, and here is just to have a physical view of some of these four sensors. These are it's, uh, some models produced by one of the market leader, which is this 80 sensor uh, devices company. Uh, they are not very cheap. Mm? Okay, so we will buy one for our uh, KUKA arm, which will cost around 5,000 euros. Okay. Of course, there are nano version. For instance, look at this series. Nano version are as large as 1.7 centimeter, hmm? like this, even less. Uh, they are nine grams of weight. So they are used for completely different purposes. In robotics, for instance, somebody has mounted this nano sensor at the tip of a finger of a dextrous robotic hand so that you can touch and feel six dimensional forces at each tip, okay? Uh, of course, you, if you go down, you may reach even, you, you look at the maximum value here, 7,200 Newton meters, so they are very rugged. And in fact, they should be also capable of sustaining extra forces, because if you take one of these objects and you let it fall on, the, on a table, the impulsive value of the force is huge. So you should be able not to crash the sensor, neither mechanically nor the electronics which is on board. Okay? This is why they cost so much, because they are robust to any use and abuse, I would say. Uh, here is another situation that brings us to discuss another issue. So again, these devices have some electronic on board, but especially the, not the last generation, but what you find still on the market, uh, it comes with a control cabinet, uh, this kind of device that you add uh, as a slot or as a separate uh, object to the cabinet of the robot controller, okay? So inside here you have further processing of data. The data goes from, so here you have, you see a, a, a force sensor mounted as an end effector of a Komau robot. I also highlighted here the sensor frame. Remember that the sensor measures quantity only in its own frame. It doesn't know if this sensor is located like this or like this or is here and so on. Okay, so the information that measured is in its own frame. The use of this information needs to be converted into the frame of our convenience mm, for control purposes. So this is why we're also using uh, rotation and transformation matrices. Now, from here you don't see, but there's a cable, this cable uh, going to this controller. Of course, the more information you can process on board, the less data you have to transfer to the controller. In particular, if from an analog, from an analog uh, circuit you can convert to digital, then when you're communicating digital signal to the controller, you are much more robust to environmental uh, electromagnetic phenomena. Okay. So typically on board you have some electronic which does acquisition and conversion analog to digital, at least. And maybe some filtering already at the digital level and then it sends out the data here. Now here you have several other processing that can be done. Uh, for instance, you can uh, define some reference frame so that the output of this controller to the controller of the robot not does not provide the raw measurement in the sensor frame, but already transferred in the frame of interest. So that you can decentralize some computation. Rather than having 
the robot controller doing all the work, it receives some data from the sensor which has already been intelligently processed in, adva in advance. Okay, something like this. So, uh, we spoke about calibration. Calibration, like for any measurement device, any sensor is very important. And here is, again, the same uh, Maltese cross device. So here I've tried to, uh, slightly better. You can see the six component, three force and three torques in the sensor frame. So they carry an S here, MX, MY, MZ, and FX, FY, FZ. And these eight numbers are the outputs of the eight strain gauges uh, mounted, uh, you see, two here, two there, two here, two there, in orthogonal direction. So this matrix which is in between is the so-called calibration matrix. It simply says where there are zeros, uh, these are structural zeros. For instance, uh, in order to measure, uh, let's see, Fx, which is the force in that direction, uh, pointing upward, you use only C13 and C17, so a linear combination of the strain gauge 3 and the strain gauge 7. The strain gauge 3 and 7 are this one and that one. For instance, you can make an average of these two information in order, because they are both sensitive to this direction. If you sense the formation there, uh, you can make the sum and divided by two and you have uh, some estimate for the FZ. So those C13 and C17 could be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, but this is not really correct because of the mounting. So they should be subject to some small calibration. How do you do the calibration? You use a known force, a known mass. You apply this to the sensor in different configuration and then you calibrate those numbers. So all this and similarly for the other components. So you, you have a set of numbers that have their nominal value but needs to be calibrated. Of course, you are assuming that there are zeros here. You may also have a full matrix and calibrate all numbers, but typically these are really, if not zero, are pretty close to zero. So it's better to put them equal to zero and not include them in some uncertainty in the calibration process. Okay, so these are only few numbers that needs to be calibrated. And once you have done this, for any new value of uh, the deformation on the strain gauges, you take out some force and torque measurement at the sensor level. And now if you want to transfer this into some other frame C, well, you use this kind of transformation matrix. You see, this is the sensor force uh, in the sensor frame, and this is the sensor moment in the sensor frame. If you want to know the force and the moment in a different frame, you use this uh, matrix, and let's read them together. The force in a different point is exactly the force in the sensor frame, only rotated by the rotation matrix which changes the orientation of the two frames. Okay, there's no difference. The force, just force in this direction, I'm just looking at the force from a different point of view. So I have just to rotate this. What about the moment? The moment takes the moment in the sensor frame and handles it as the force in the previous case. So it rotates from the sensor to the reference C frame. However, there's another contribution now because I can generate another part of the moment in the new frame coming from a force. Because the force at, at the sensor in, at another point generate a moment hmm, because of the distance. So you have a vector going from the center of frame C to the center of the sensor frame expressed in frame C and then you do this kind of product means that you will take this force, express it into the 
C frame and then do the vector product with this distance. And you see that this notation with the skew symmetric matrix in place of the vector is very handy because now I can make a product of rotation matrix times this matrix. If I had here a vector product, I don't know how to handle the rotation matrix. Okay. So the notation that we have introduced that replaces uh, vector products between vectors with products of a skew symmetric matrix times a vector, here it's very convenient. Okay. So this is something that you, you should uh, digest. Okay. And in fact, in the force sensor control cabinet, that boxes that I show you there, you can define multiple tool center points, multiple frames, so that the same sensor, while using different tools, can automatically uh, provide the uh, sensor measurement in the frame of interest to the current tool. So applying different matrices like this, depending on the tool that you are using. Question on this? No. So how these, are these sensors used? Well, typically, for instance, in this application, you have the robot, you have the four-store sensor. The top plate is attached to the end effector of the robot. The bottom plate is attached to the tool. So this is a rigid body. And the tool is in contact with some metallic surface and has a, let's say, rotating uh, tool that is used to smoothen uh, the corner while, so moving along while pushing against the object. So here we have to control the force at this contact point. We cannot measure it here, but we know the geometry. So uh, the measurement in the sensor frame is transferred here. And now we can see if we are applying too much force in the normal direction or not. Okay, and if we are applying too much force, then we command the robot to release its motion in that direction. Okay, or this is a complex assembly of mechanical parts. For instance, you want to assemble a gear or a motor where you have a T's that should engage, and if you just push down the things, you may hit some T's, and so uh, you were not able to insert it completely. But if you sense this force, you can rotate a little bit, do some vibratory motion until the force sensor tells you that there's no more force in that direction, and now you can push and insert things. So these are typical application of force sensing. And before looking at a couple of videos of this, let's also discuss an object which looks, sim looks similar, huh? very like the force sensor. So again, it's a cylinder. Again, it's mounted on the end effector. Again, it has two plates, huh? a top plates on the robot and a bottom plates. And below the bottom plates, you can mount some tools, huh? like in the previous slide. And these two plates are connected. And here you can slightly recognize some by elastic couplings. Multiple springs connected in a very tricky way. What is the purpose of this spring? The purpose is to let this device, the bottom place of this device, react to forces applied to specific point. And this specific point is the so-called remote center of compliance. As if there were no mechanical coupling at all. Which means, if I'm pushing in this direction, the bottom plate will move only in that direction. In general, if you have two objects, one kept fixed and one elastically coupled, if you're pushing in one direction, this will change orientation or go slightly on the side and so on and so on. So the way in which this RCC is uh, designed is to decouple forces and motion along the various directions in a passive way. So it's the mechanical reaction of the device that is decoupled itself. So here is a, an example of use of RCC for assembly. These RCC are very common in the assembly 
for assembly tasks because they are able to recover in a right, rather easy way, simple way, without software effort, in a sense, small misalignment. For instance, you will see then a, a, a video of this. Suppose that on top you have the robot, like that assembly robot there. So the robot is here and it needs to insert this peg in this hole. And here is a, an RCC device in between. So the robot just moves and push downwards. Assuming that you are perfectly aligned with the hole, so you are at the center of the hole and the hole is not misaligned laterally. There's no cogging at all. Okay, if this was the case, you enter inside and that's it. Typically you have also some chamfer here which invites you to go inside the hole, okay? Now, since you're slightly off the center, and by the way, in this case, also, this is not perfectly horizontal, so it's just amplifying some physical error that you can have. So the object held by the gripper, which is mounted below the RCC, so it's attached to the bottom plate of the RCC, so this point will get in contact with some side, uh, from some side of the hole. So here you generate a force, and this is like a force felt by the, uh, by the bottom plate, and automatically the bottom plate will move while the top plate remains still. It's doing what the robot is doing. It's progressing very slowly, but progress, continue to progress in the same way. So this is moved on the side in reaction of this force, because the design of this RCC or of this device has put the center, remote center of compliance more or less at the contact point. So if I'm applying a force here, it will move only in that direction. If I'm applying a force here, it will move only in that direction and so on and so on. Okay, so here there's a component that will let me move on the side. So I'm continuing, the robot doesn't feel any changes. It continues slowly to push. Now the RCC is deformed only laterally. So it gets in two-point contact here now because it's moved on the side and now the first contact here is followed by a second contact on the other side. Now this two contact will produce some torque. Two forces produce some torque. And this torque, to this torque, this plate will react uh, in the same direction, so with the same rotation. So it will slightly rotate and adjust, align to the fact that the hole was not completely vertical. Okay, this is the way in which uh, RCC operate. Of course, this works only for limited errors. If you have 10 centimeter of mismatch with the hole, you don't get anywhere, okay? And in that case, you need some higher level reasoning about force information to understand that you have to move and look for the hole. But if this solution is very handy and very efficient in case of small, very small errors. Okay, so this is a video. It's a very quick video, so we may need to look at it again and again, in which this RCC device, now you can see the uh, connection which are elastic element uh, between the top plate and the bottom plate. And below there's a object and there's an insertion, actually on, uh, it's a negative insertion you will see. Uh, I, I don't remember if the video goes in slow motion, otherwise we will look at it once more. So first there is a description of whatever this RCC, but by the way, this RCC I'll build by the same company that makes sense for sensors. So you see that the RCC is here, the gripper is going down and inserting something in this part. Now you will see a close-up view. Here it is. You see these parts? These are two uh, metal things and the holes are actually on the robot side. And you, you have seen some slight deformation in the slow motion that accommodates for this uh, lateral 
error and angular small error. Is enough? Maybe. I don't think if we see it again that we will understand better than that. Now, this is another very nice example. It's a very old video, I should say. But this video, I hope, will let you understand exactly the pros and cons of having a force sensor. So this is a very complex task in which a motor shaft of a motor for a car uh, needs to be inserted uh, in the, uh, inside the motor body. Okay, so it's a long shaft that needs to enter a small hole and then engage with all the machinery that is inside the motor. And if you do this by hand, you will need to adjust to the force that you sense in your hand. So if the robot has no such capability, it's very hard to do this geometrically, just inserting this. You will uh, typically hit some uh, heavy surface and not be able to progress. Now, with the force sensor, you can do this, and you will see it in the video. Again, this is a commercial video, but not too much commercial. So this is a realization by ABB and ATI, they say a revolutionary new world of automated assembly, but I mean, that's partly true. So they developed some software on top of this. Of course, you can imagine that uh, you can uh, make key in hand solution for, for uh, an industry. So look at this situation. So this is the part that needs to be inserted and this is the force sensor. The man is pushing beyond the force sensor and the robot is moving. If it's pushing before the force sensor, the robot is not moving. So let's, let's stop the video for a moment. Again, robot, force sensor, and device to be inserted. Okay. If I'm pushing here, nothing happens. Why? Because the force sensor doesn't measure this. The robot is controlling position, so it's held this position unless he senses some force and then if he senses some force tends to move in the direction that we reduce this force okay so if I'm pushing here the robot doesn't move at all but if I'm pushing here there's a force in this direction and sensed from the force torque sensor and so I'm commanding a motion of the end effector in the same direction so that until I see zero force again so I can push it, push it, push it, and so on. But if I push it here, nothing happens. OK, this is what you see in this first part of the video. Just to, OK. And now this ca long camshaft is inserted into the motor block. So this is a close-up view. You can see that it's pretty limited tolerance. And every time it stops, it's because it feels some force and needs to adjust and slightly rotate also the things until the full insertion is performed. It's a long shaft. Huh? And inside the carb, and then you have also this final uh, gear that you have to properly reorient. Uh, this is another assembly of the same type. Here you have really a lot of teeth, and in fact you see the lateral motion. Eh? The rotation needs to find the right orientation of the parts so that you can insert things. This is inserting pistons into the motor. Again, this is force control. You search the best position, you probably look over with a vision camera to locate the hole, but once you're getting in contact, you forget about the vision, you just command based on the force information. It's like when you're assembly things with your hands, you first look at the things with your eyes, but when they get closer, you can do the assembly even without looking at the parts, just feeling the force exchange. This is the case of this situation. Okay, I think we can move on. 
So this is another application in which it's nice because here the tool is not held by the robot, but the tool is in the workspace. The robot is holding the part, huh? so in a, in a complementary way, and is moving the part by presenting different surfaces of this part to the moving tool, which is this rotating abrasive things. So again, here you can see here the force torque sensor is this one. Then there's some gripper holding this part. So it's a surface finishing application. So you need to push the object and apply some forces. Otherwise, this is not able to remove the extra material and make this surface very smooth. Okay, so this is just the complementary. Again, typical application of force torque sense. Any question on this? Okay, let's start at least the first uh, proximity sensor. So now, now we're removing contact. Of course, the force torque sensor needs contact. Huh? Otherwise, it doesn't measure anything. What about being on the distance? For instance, this infrared device was the one used, you remember that video of the space uh, Rotex mission where the astronaut should use the manipulator and in particular some mechatronic and defector to grab floating object in the lab, in the space lab. So in that case, you had a camera placed between the grippers and infrared sensor that detect the presence of an object between the grip. Infrared sensor of this kind. So what is the working principle? Well, the, it's a, there's a light emitting diode in the infrared uh, domain. So this is the uh, wavelength of typical uh, LEDs, which is sent out. It will be reflected by some object. And then there's a, another phototransistor collecting energy coming back. Okay, so there is a, the, a typical uh, infrared sensor has an emitter and a receiver. So you can emit while you're receiving. Of course, you're receiving some reflection from some past emission, but this is not really a problem. Uh, their use is typically only indoor, otherwise they are blinded, blinded by the light, by the sunlight. And of course there are a lot of problems, because this is a perfect reflectance. Uh, of course there are objects which absorb infrared or deviate the way in which they are geometric place. So you're emitting something and you're not receiving anything. So you imagine that in that direction there is no obstacle. Okay. The other thing which needs to be uh, looked at is the range of measurement. Uh, so the range of values that can be measured. Remember, all this terminology we introduced at the beginning of this long sensor overview. So resolution, range, linearity in the range of measurement and things like that. So typically you can go with very close range, 4 to 30 centimeter, to up 1 meter 50. Of course, the more you go, the more expensive is the infrared sensor, which otherwise is very cheap. You can find, for less than 15 euros, you can find uh, an infrared sensor. For instance, this sharp, this by sharp. And this is the size. No, this is a coin. Uh, this is, well, 10 cent, US cent. And uh, this is the size of a typical infrared sensor. Uh, these sensors are not used alone. For instance, you can have a, an infrared sensor, two infrared sensors in the uh, jaws, in the jaws of a gripper. Or for navigation, this is a, a circular ring with onboard electronic, which can be mounted like the slice of a cake uh, on top of 
This was the Nomad 200 mobile robot. So you can have this infrared ring or not. If you have it, you place this slice, and then you place another slice with ultrasonic sensor, and so on and so on. Okay. And in this case, you have a ring of 16 infrared sensors. So going, pointing, in, dividing the 360 degrees in sectors and having information in the various di direction, limited in, in range again, hmm? 10, 15 centimeter, and so on. Another typical aspect is the following. So fortunately, these are inches, not centimeters, but uh, one inch is 2.5 centimeters. So if you are here, 10, we are at 25 centimeters. Uh, 50, we are at 120, uh, 125. Uh. Okay, so uh, if you're pointing in one direction and you receive the full amount of energy back, the more you're far, the less power has the signal that comes back. However, inside this range, you see that this is not a linear behavior. You see that this energy comes pretty soon down and then stays low for a while. Of course, it goes even beyond, but then you have not enough resolution of your electronics to catch up this kind of low level of signals. And then, in this electronics, you have to do some kind of, what is the term in, for, for hi-fi music, uh, equalizing, eh? equalization. Equalization in the sense that you want to modify this natural behavior of the sensor to make it, to render it as linear as possible. Okay, so you invert this so that you have, uh, for equal increment of distance, you have equal signal as output, okay? Uh, another type of sensor is based on ultrasound. Ultrasound sensor use again waves, but emitted in a different range, uh, ultrasonic range, uh, and use the propagation of these waves in the environment. Same story as before, so that you may have some absorbing walls so that you send this wave in that direction and you never receive back something, or you receive it too late in order to be a useful signal. Uh, this is quite uh, high frequency, so beyond uh, 20 kilohertz, but most of the time this ultrasonic sensor works at 50 kilohertz. Uh, why is that? Because they are work with a piezoelectric device, which in this case, works both as an emitter and as a receiver. So there is a one phase in which you're applying voltage to the piezoelectric uh, sensor, and this starts to vibrate. And if it vibrates, it will produce waves going in the environment, okay? And this continues for a while. While you're emitting waves, you cannot receive them back. Okay, and this gives automatically a lower bound on the range of measurement. Because if you're working at 50 kilohertz and you're emitting for some milliseconds, then if you do the computation, you cannot receive, you're not ready to receive something back before some time, which means that the object should be uh, not very, very close. Okay, so there's a lower limit to the range. It seems strange, but just because ultrasonic devices have uh, the, compo the basic component which works at the same time or in different time, but either as an emitter or as a receiver. Okay, so you compute then a time of flight. So the time needed for one wave to go to the object, return, and being detected. Okay, and proportionally to that and proportionally also to the length wave, you can assess some distance. Now, this emission is not really unidirectional. 
even LEDs are not unidirectional, but they have a cone of energy very restricted. While here you see a typical plot of energy around the midpoint of emission. So in this emission, of course, the energy is the most, but you have these side lobes, typical of uh, ultrasonic or to wave expansion. So you're emitting energy within a cone, let's say, of 30 degrees. Sometimes you put kind of a uh, cone in front of the ultrasonic sensor so that you limit emission to a smaller solid angles. By the way, this is not just planar, it's in space. Okay. Uh, which, so for instance, the typical emitting angle is about 30 degrees, so 15 degrees on this side and 50 degrees on that side. So by removing these uh, side lobes, which is good and bad. It's good because if I'm pointing to some wall, well, I, if the wall has, I mean, if I'm not pointing directly to where the object is, but a little bit on the side, I still can have a reflection, okay? So I have a, small, a larger coverage in angle. And of course, the more distance I go, the, the more space space the fixed 30 degrees covers in the distance, okay? This is good, but this is also bad because I'm not sure in this cone where exactly is the obstacle reflecting my, my wave, okay? So if I want to build an accurate information of the, of the map of the environment with ultrasonic sensor, uh, I'm confused. I need to filter, process, move a little bit the sensor, redo the measurement, combine them, do what is called sensor fusion in order to have a good map uh, of the environment. So here uh, is what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. For instance, this is the sensor and within this code cone you emit waves and this is the central instance but you measure the shortest object. This is the first one that gives you information. And then this minimum, this measure distance, means that you don't know where this wall is. It could be at any point around this. Okay, this is the approximation that you encounter. And this is the typical situation. If you're going around with this sensor in a, uh, in a office environment or in a university with a, uh, windows, doors, and so on, you have approximation to the fact that this signal enters, disappears somewhere, sometimes has multiple reflection, and so on and so on. If you receive this wave after a multiple reflection, typically going there, then going there, and then coming back, of course the time of flight is larger, it's longer, so you expect that in that direction where you emitted, the obstacle is farther away, which is not the case, okay? So there are multiple things that should be taken into account. But still, these sensors are not so expensive. And this is the, very briefly, and then we will stop. This is the typical uh, signal profiles. So you have some, the sensor has some supply voltage then there's a, some signal saying, okay, I'm starting doing a measurement, which means that you send a number of pulses at 50 hertz, 50 kilohertz in the, uh, in the environment. And while doing this, you have internally the electronic which is blinded because you should not accept anything else because you're emitting. Otherwise, you get confused by the same signal that you're transmitting, okay? And then, as you have some times after this ended, so from here on you start listening to the environment and you compute time. And if time gets too longer, you just eliminate it. Even if you receive something, but it's too long, it's so unreliable that you prefer to eliminate this information. And here is a typical 
Polaroid ultrasound sound sensor, you see that you can buy completed with uh, some electronics for less than 30 euros. The range is a bit large, longer than the previous one. There's a lower bound, so you see that you, you cannot go for this particular model, you cannot go closer than half a meter right? because of this transmission and uh, reflection uh, simultaneous effect. Uh, to have an idea, the time of flight at a distance of 60 centimeters in this case is about 3.5 milliseconds. And again, even ultrasonic sensors, when mounted, these are typically mounted on mobile robots. I haven't seen any manipulator having an ultrasonic sensor on board. They may have a device, a sensing device carried around by the end effector. This is a different story. So it's an ultrasonic sensor, but not on the robot, on the measuring tool that is carried around by the robot and the effector. So in a mobile robot, again, you have a circular mounting, for instance, 16 or 32. And in order to avoid that this sensor uh, have interference, if you have this ring of sensor, you typically activate pairs which are opposite. So you have a, a reading uh, sequence, which is 1, 16, 2, 17, 3, 18, and so on, if you have 32 sensor like this. Uh, there's another trick. If you have only 16 of such sensor and you have enough time, uh, you can do an acquisition of 16 measurement in the various direction and then rotate the turret of this robot by 16 degrees and do another acquisition so that you have uh, more information if you're not moving the robot. If you're moving with the robot, then this is getting lost. Okay, I think we will stop here because the next is an application and it requires too much. So we will see each other on Friday. Bye.